Hey, if you're just joining us for the first time this Sunday, my name is Jeff. I'm one of the pastors here, and we're studying through the book of Hebrews. For the last several weeks, we've been trying to look at the significance of the price that was paid for our sins when Jesus went to the cross. If you were here for the last couple of weeks and you've missed that, I failed you as a preacher. We've tried to look at the immense cost that was placed on Jesus for the forgiveness of our sins. And if you've missed that over the last couple of months from the book of Hebrews, I've totally failed you. Last week, we said that now Jesus has atoned for our sins. Now that he has become the payment to rescue us back from our sins, we are totally and completely free from sin. And today, what I want you to see is that you're free from the guilt of sin as well. But I don't know if you've ever thought about it this way or not. That leaves a problem that we really need to deal with. If you were looking at the worship guide that's in front of you, or if you're following along in our mobile app and you saw this title today, my guess is it caught you off guard a little bit. Three things that God cannot do. Jeff, I think we believe around here that God is all-powerful. We believe that God is all-knowing. We believe that God is all-present. So how can it be that God cannot do something and still be God at the same time? It almost sounds like God and cannot in the same sentence is a logical contradiction. But I hope before today's over with, you see that because of Jesus and his sacrifice for us, there's a few things now that God cannot and God will not do. So I want to pray for us, and in just a second, I want us to dig into Hebrews chapter 10. We'll start at verse 1, and we'll do our best to get to verse 18 today from the book of Hebrews. Let's pray together. God, Thank you for your amazing grace that covers us. God, thank you for how that has changed forever our relationship with you. And today, Father, I ask you to speak to your people in this room. I pray that for those who don't know Jesus, today would be the day that they surrender it all to him. And Holy Spirit, I pray that before this is over with, we all walk out of here seeing how different our life can be because of Jesus. I pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay, so here's the first thing that God cannot do now that Jesus has come. And the first thing is that he cannot return to the old system. The old system that I'm referring to, of course, is the Old Testament sacrificial system. Listen now, Hebrews chapter 10, starting in verse 1, words this. Verses 1 through 4. The old system under the law of Moses was only a shadow a dim preview of good things to come. Not the good things themselves. The sacrifices under that system were repeated again and again, year after year. But they were never able to provide perfect cleansing for those who came to worship. If they could have provided perfect cleansing, the sacrifices would have stopped, for the worshipers would have been purified once for all time. And their feelings of guilt would have disappeared. But instead, those sacrifices actually reminded them. Think about this for just a second. It made guilt worse. But instead, those sacrifices actually reminded them of their sins year after year. For it is not possible for the blood of bulls and goats to take away sins. Okay, we have a problem in these verses. And the problem is that we believe God to be eternal. He exists outside of human time like you and I exist. God always was, God always will be. So there's never a point in human history where God doesn't, is not at work in human history. And Hebrews is saying that God cannot go back to the Old Testament system. He has completely moved beyond it. It's a bit of a problem for us if we were honest with each other. The writer of Hebrews is basically taking the entire Old Testament system and he's putting it in the camp. And he uses this illustration. Picture this for just a second. All right, all of you artists in this room or all you in, uh, aspiring artists, here's the idea that he gives you. He says the Old Testament is like a shadow. If you were in this room last week, you saw us put that big, huge Ford pickup truck on the front lawn and I told you that the Old Testament system is like this little remote control truck, not like the real deal out there. Well, the word shadow that he uses here is kind of a painter's term. A master artist would sit down, but before he would actually start to put paint on a canvas, 
they'd use chalk or they would use pencils and they would start to draw this line drawing, kind of sketching out what they want the actual work of art to look like when it's done. That sketching out is the word shadow. It's just the general sketch of the real thing. And then after the sketch is done, then the artist starts to put paint to canvas. And he turns this thing into a vivid masterpiece. And once you have the vivid masterpiece in front of you, that line drawing, that rough sketch is never going to satisfy you anymore. It's only a shadow of the real thing. Hebrews says that Old Testament system, it was a shadow of the real thing. It's not the real thing itself. And it's not designed to fulfill what the real thing could fulfill. Only Jesus could do that. And he says, by the way, the Old Testament system, it actually made our guilt worse. I want you to think back with me for just a second. For some of you in this room, this probably wasn't that long ago. For many of you, you're going to have to work hard at this. I want you to think back to the first sin that you committed that you can remember. Maybe you told a lie to your parents. Maybe you took something that didn't belong to you, but you knew what you were doing was wrong. And if you think back hard enough with me to those moments immediately after you committed that first sin, you probably remember the guilt that went along with it, the shame that went along with it. You probably remember worrying that you were going to get caught because what you did was wrong and you know what you did was wrong. But I'm convinced every human being, the first time that they sin, they know deep down inside it was wrong. And they experience this guilt that goes along with it. I'm convinced it's in our DNA. It comes from God's nature being placed on us in the Garden of Eden. And we experience this guilt of knowing, I did wrong against my parents when I lied. I did wrong to this person that I took something from that didn't belong to me. And ultimately knowing that what I did is I did wrong against God. My sin is an offense to God. And Hebrews says your guilt is actually worse in the Old Testament because those sacrifices never really cleansed you. They just reminded you over and over and over again that you were dirty and you needed to be cleaned, but cleaned on the inside, not on the outside. There's a guy who experienced this firsthand. In fact, it almost cost him his life. He lived in 18th century England. His name is William Cowper. Cowper was a politician. He was a member of the House of Commons. And Cowper was a notorious sinner. And his political enemies made sport of his sin. It showed up regularly in the newspapers. It was a matter of public record. Cowper got to the point personally where every time he was in public, all that he could see is the scorn of people around him because of his sin. It almost overwhelmed him to the point that he didn't couldn't live under the pressure of that guilt anymore. So Cowper made a decision to take his own life. He went to the Tower of London and attempted to throw himself off, but was prevented. He went to the local apothecary, the drugstore, and bought some poison, enough medicine to poison himself. And every time he tried to take it, he went through fits of seizure and couldn't actually get the medicine inside him, couldn't bring himself to kill himself. He was so, he wrestled so much with his own guilt and his own shame that finally he checked himself into a mental institution. It was in this mental institution that Cowper was confronted with the gospel of Jesus and his life was radically and totally turned around. You may not recognize the name, but you'll recognize the words because Cowper became a famous hymn writer. And in 1772, he wrote these words. He said, There is a fountain filled with blood that flows from Emmanuel's veins, and sinners plunged beneath the flood lose all their guilty stains, and sinners plunged beneath that flood, the flood of Jesus' blood, lose all their guilt and stains, their guilty stains. What Jesus did 2,000 years ago was once for all settled the issue for your sin. You are totally and completely free if you know him personally. And you should be free from the guilt that goes along with it as well. God cannot return to the Old Testament system, that old system, because God cannot reject Jesus' sacrifice. Hebrews chapter 10 is pretty specific about this, pretty blatant about this. Verses 5 through 10, God cannot reject Jesus' sacrifice. 
Verse 5, Hebrews 10. This is why when Christ came into the world, he said, you did not want animal sacrifices or sin offerings, but you've given me a body to offer. You were not pleased with burnt offerings or other offerings for sin. And then I said, look, I've come to do your will, O God, as it is written about me in the scriptures. For Christ, first Christ said, you did not want animal sacrifices or sin offerings or burnt offerings or other offerings for sin, nor were you pleased with them, though they were required by the law of Moses. And then he said, look, I have come to do your will. He, Jesus, speaking of Jesus, he, Jesus, cancels the first covenant in order to put the second into effect. For God's will was for us to be made holy by the sacrifice of the body of Jesus Christ one time for all time. One sacrifice that impacts our life even to this day. If you were a Jew and you read this for the first time 2,000 years ago, the writer of Hebrews said to you, your sacrifices can't make you right with God. He said, your sin offerings, they don't make you right with God. Your burnt offerings, the other offerings that you offer. This is all four offerings, the only time anywhere in the New Testament that all four offerings show up at one place at one time. And he puts them all four together and says, all four of these together can't make you right with God. They show you that you're not right with God, but they can't make you right with God. They were never intended to do that for you. In fact, he quotes directly from Psalm chapter 40. He quotes the words of David, and he says, basically, that Jesus inspired David when David wrote these words. God was not pleased. It was never God's intent that sacrifices, the sacrifice of bulls and goats, could make you right with him. There's a good story about this in the Old Testament. Israel's first king, King Saul, God had given him basically all power in Israel, sent him off to war, and said, go off against this foreign army. You're going to be victorious. I want you to annihilate everyone, kill everyone, to include their animals. And King Saul, when he went off to battle, he was successful in war. He killed everyone except a few animals, and he left the king, King Agag, this foreign king, alive. I think Saul did it because he wanted to show off his military power. So then the prophet Samuel shows up after the battle's over. with, And Samuel says to Saul, Hey, Saul, didn't God tell you to kill everyone, even to kill the animals? And Saul says, well, Samuel, I kept these animals alive because I'm going to sacrifice them to God. God's going to be pleased with my sacrifice. It's incredible what Samuel says to Saul next in 1 Samuel chapter 15, verse 22. Samuel looks the king of Israel in the eyes. And he says, does the Lord take pleasure in burnt offerings or sacrifices as much as in obeying? Then he goes on to answer the question. He says, look, it's better to obey than to sacrifice. And it's better to pay attention to God's commands than to offer the fat of rams. Sacrifice is just a religious ritual if it's not tied to the sacrifice of Jesus Christ. And only the sacrifice of Jesus Christ can make you right with God. That's what Hebrews is trying to teach us today. Jesus took on a body just so that it could be broken and sacrificed for our sins. And that and that alone makes us right with God. Religious rituals, we teach this around here, religious rituals don't earn you a way to heaven. You couldn't earn your way to heaven all on your own. It takes God stepping in and rescuing you in the form of his son, Jesus. Jesus lives a perfect life. Here's the transaction that a Christian goes through if you know Christ personally. He takes the sin that you deserve to pay for and he places it on, the son of, on his son, Jesus. And then God takes the perfect life that Jesus lived and he gives you credit for it. It's called imputed righteousness. God takes Jesus' perfect life and he gives you credit for it. And when you stand before him, you stand before him not condemned. Not condemned because of the sacrifice that Jesus made on your behalf and also made right with God because of the perfect life that Jesus lived. That's the transaction that happens at the cross, and only the Christian can be made right with God. That's why God cannot reject Jesus' sacrifice, because it was pure, and it was perfect, and it came attached to a life of perfect obedience.
You see, Jesus' death changes everything. Long ago, um, the country of Greece was ruled by a brutal dictator. This is right after World War II as communism was spreading around much of Europe. And General Metaxas was a famous general in Greece. He took over power and he became a brutal general, ruled with an iron fist over the country of Greece. Years into his rule, he was much older in life and he was a famous aviator when he was in war. Greece purchased a new set of technology. They purchased a hydroplane, a seaplane is what we would refer to it. General Metaxas went up in one of the first voyages in the seaplane. His staff took him out in a boat. They brought him to the seaplane. They put him in the plane. The pilot took the plane off of the water, very smooth takeoff. And then he said to the general, would you like to take over? Would you like to fly? Immediately, the general's flight training, all of his experience in the air came back to him. He flew this airplane perfectly until he just about got ready to land. Because he went back to the very first thing that he remembered and he started to get ready to land this airplane on an airport. The pilot who was sitting next to him was terrified because he knew that this man was a brutal dictator and he knew that what was about to happen would kill both of them. So in total fear, he uh, kind of nervously said to the general, "Um, sir, don't you think it would be best for us to land this plane in the water since it is a hydroplane? At the last second, the general pulled the plane off of the ground, flew it around, and landed it back in the lake that it took off from. There was this awkward silence for just a few minutes. Then General Metaxas looked over at him and he said, Sir, I must compliment you. You saved both of our lives today. I don't know what I was thinking when I almost landed this plane on the land, and it would have surely killed us both. And upon saying that, he opened the door and stepped right out into the water, forgetting right where he was, and fell right into the water. There's a, Hebrews is saying that if you're new to Christianity, let me explain what sets this apart from every other religion in human history. Every other religion teaches that somehow, some way, you work your way to God. Christianity teaches, no, you couldn't possibly work your way to God, even if you wanted to, and attempting to work your way to God is an offense. It is a slap in his faith and the sacrifice that's been made on your behalf. As Christians, we believe that you can't be good enough to earn your way to heaven because it takes perfection, and none of us in this room can measure up against that standard. But Jesus did, And God places our sin on his shoulders and gives us credit for the perfect life that Jesus lived. And because of Jesus' perfect obedience, God cannot, nor will he, reject Jesus' sacrifice when you're covered with the blood of Jesus. His grace covers you. And every sin that you ever have or ever will commit, which is where I really want us to dwell for the next few minutes. You see, Hebrews says that God cannot remember. Listen to how I worded this. God cannot remember our sins anymore. How is it possible that God who is all-knowing cannot remember something that you and I cannot forget? Listen to how Hebrews chapter 10, verses 11 through 18 word this. It says, under the old covenant, the priests stand and minister before the altar day after day, offering the same sacrifices again and again, blah, 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 which can never take away sin. But our high priest, he's speaking of Jesus, but our high priest offered himself to God as a single sacrifice for sins, good for all time. Put your finger there for just a second. How did people in the Old Testament become right with God? They did it by believing that there would one day come a sacrifice and that sacrifice would atone for their sins once for all time. How did people during Jesus' lifetime come to a relationship with God? They did it by believing that the man in front of them, that his sacrifice was an atonement for their sins. And 2,000 years later, how do you and I have a personal relationship with God the exact same way every human being in human history has? By believing that that man 2,000 years ago in his death on the cross satisfied once for all time the debt of our sin. Let me go back and read the rest of verse 12 now. Because the rest of verse 12 says, Then he, Jesus, sat down in the place of honor at God's right hand. And there he waits until his enemies are humbled and made a footstool under his feet. 
For by that one offering, he forever made perfect those who are being made holy. And the Holy Spirit also testifies that this is so, for he says, this is the new covenant I will make with my people on that day, declares the Lord. I will put my law in their hearts, and I will write them on their minds. And then he says, listen to the way that he words this. Then he says, I will never again, God will never again remember their sins and their lawless deeds. And when sins have been forgiven, there is no need to offer any more sacrifices. Has somebody who's done you wrong sincerely asked you to forgive them? And then in the process, they came up to you and they asked you to forgive and to forget what they've done to you? You know, that may be one of the most stupid statements I've ever heard in my life. Because the truth is, when somebody's done you wrong, really, really bad done you wrong, even if they've sincerely asked for your forgiveness, even if they've showed you that they're not going to do it wrong again, even if you've really forgiven them, it may be impossible, it probably will be impossible for you to ever forget what they've done to you in the past. It's hurt you so bad, that hurt goes so deep that my guess is you'll never forget it. You'll carry those scars with you for the rest of your life, but that doesn't mean you can't forgive it. Hebrews is saying God not only forgives your sin, but he forgets your sin. And in fact, he uses the Greek word in the original language here, amnesis. Does that word sound familiar to you? It's the word that we would use for amnesia. It's saying that God literally has amnesia. When, he, when you ask him about your sin, if you've been covered under the blood of Jesus Christ, if you were to go to God and say, hey God, remember those sins that I committed against you a long time ago? Remember that stuff that I did ju just did yesterday? God would say, I don't know what you're talking about. I have no memory of that. Now how is it possible that the God who knows everything cannot remember the sins that you've committed against, you, against him? The answer is, he chooses to constrain himself. He chooses to forget and never again hold those sins against you. He chooses to move beyond those sins and never even to remember them again. This is what the Bible describes when it says God casts our sin away as far as the east is from the west. He chooses to not remember those sins anymore. Now listen to me for just a second. Look up here. You have no business, Christian, holding something against yourself that God doesn't hold against you any longer. You have no business holding guilt and shame against yourself when it's been settled once and for all by the blood of Jesus Christ. And you will never be all that God wants you to be until you've moved beyond your sin and your guilt and your shame and you have started to become all that God has created you to be. I stumbled across this amazing video this week. It's part of a teaching series by Tully and Favician called One Way Love. And I want you to see Cynthia's story. I want you to see how guilt and shame held her back until she moved past it. And I want you to see all that God has done in her life since then. Watch this video. For 365 days a year, for 15 years, I used meth on a daily basis. It destroyed my life, and along with that, the drug addiction came crime. I sold the drugs so I could make money to do the drugs. In and out of jail, getting busted for, for selling the drugs, and my last arrest was for um, manufacturing and distributing controlled substance, which was meth. And as I was in jail, I wasn't getting out. I was looking at some serious time in prison. I was in the jail cell, and this girl came into my cell, and she told me about a book that helped her. So I read a book. I read it for five hours straight through, and as I was reading it, something was happening on the inside of me. I was, I was starting to feel again. I was starting to think that maybe there was a hope for my life. After five hours, I shut that book, I got on my knees, and I got radically saved. I couldn't come out of my cell for 23 hours a day, so it was just me and the Lord reading the Word. I started seeing my life in the eyes of God. My heart was breaking for the sins that I had done. I 
did not know how to deal with them. So I literally took out a pad of paper and I started writing down the things that I did. But I was so guilty. I was so hurt for the things that I had done. I sat down with my lawyer one day and I just looked at him and I said, I have to plead guilty. I am guilty of all the charges plus hundreds more. And he said, okay, cut and dry case. Yes, ma'am. So my, my day in court happened. I uh, was sitting there in front of the judge. My attorney told me not to say anything about Jesus. Just as the DA goes to stand up to say she deserves prison, the judge stopped everything. She turned to me and she said, Cynthia, I wanna see you succeed. She said, if you ever stand in front of me again, I am going to give you five years flat in prison. But if you come back in front of me in one year without any violations on your probation, then I'm just going to give you probation and I'm gonna let you live your life on the outside. You could have heard a pin drop in that courtroom. The DA's mouth flew open and I am just shaking my head, yes ma'am. And inside, I was so excited because if Jesus Christ's name couldn't be mentioned in that courtroom, nobody was gonna talk. After the judge gave me a second opportunity, I had to learn how to live life again. I go to apply for a job, so I go and tell them how good I am with people and what God has done in my life, and I'm good with money because I was a drug dealer. And i that's how I got my first job. They actually hired me. Through that job, I learned how, how to work and how to have ethics and integrity and character and those types of things. After years of integrating and trying to find out who I was as an adult woman now, I always had a, a, a seat in my heart to go back into the jails and go back into the prisons. But because of my record, I mean, it was almost impossible. Nobody would let me back in. Finally, after, after 10 years, an opportunity opened up for me and there was actually a full-time paid position for a, a female chaplain in the county jail, just like the one I was saved at. So now what I get to do every day, and simply because of God's grace, I get to go back into that jail every day with the keys in my hand, and I get to share the grace of God just like he shared it with me. This is going to sound sick. It's going to sound twisted. But for those of you in this room who do not know Jesus personally, I want you to feel the weight of the shame and the guilt of your own sin. Because I hope that that drives you towards Jesus and towards a relationship with him and trusting in him and nothing else. But if you know Christ personally, I don't want you to hang on anymore to the guilt of sin. I don't want you to hang on today to something that God isn't hanging on to anymore. I don't care how much of a mess you've made of your life. I don't care how far you've got off track. I don't care how many of those Ten Commandments you broke. If that's you, but you know Christ personally, I want you to move beyond sin and into the relationship with God that he wants you to have and to be all that God has created you to be. Something fascinating happens in Hebrews chapter 10. Would you put verse 14 back up on the screen for just a second? Look carefully at the language of Hebrews chapter 10, verse 14. I want you to see the difference, not just 2,000 years ago, but right now today that Jesus makes. Look at this verse. For by that one offering that Jesus made 2,000 years ago, he forever made perfect, notice, past tense, he forever made perfect those who are being made holy, present tense, right now, today, 2,000 years later, my life is different because of what Jesus did for me. And I hope the same thing is true of you. Every Christian who's ever walked on the planet, I hope they would say, what he did 2,000 years ago made me perfect, and today I'm still being made holy because of what he did for me. You see, God cannot return to the old system because he cannot reject Jesus' sacrifice. And as a result, God cannot even remember your sins any longer if you know him personally. I'm going to challenge us in just a second to take the next steps. I'm going to challenge that if you're the Christian that's been living under the weight of sin, today is the day you cast that weight off and you start to live with freedom and start to become all that God has created you to be. But I'm going to pray that for somebody in this room, today is the day they're confronted with the gospel of Jesus Christ and their life 
is changed forever. Would you bow your heads? Would you let me pray for us? And then would you respond how the whole, as however the Holy Spirit is speaking to you or your heart right now? God, there is no way we can thank you. There's no way that we can say thank you for what you've done for us, for your sacrifice, and for the gift of your Son who takes away the guilt of our sin and who makes us holy in your sight because of the perfect life that he's lived. God, today I pray for your people. I pray right now for those men and women in this room who know you personally, who confess faith in you. They're not trusting and walking an aisle. They're not trusting and praying a prayer. They're not trusting in some good works that they're done, they've done in the past. They're trusting only in Jesus and what he's done for them. And they live differently because of it. But I pray for somebody in this room right now, maybe more than one person, who for the first time in their life is realizing, I don't have freedom from my sin because I've never turned it all over to Jesus Christ. I pray that right now where they're sitting, they make a simple but a total commitment to him. Holding nothing back, they say, God, I am a sinner. I cannot be good enough to earn my freedom from sin. But I trust in Jesus. I trust in his perfect life. I trust in his death. I trust in his resurrection right now. And today where I'm sitting, this is just between me and you, God. I'm committing it all to him. I will go wherever he asks me to go. I will do whatever he asks me to do. And Father, I know that if that prayer is real, if it's sincere, then you change their life by putting your Holy Spirit inside them and you change them in their mind and in their hearts from the inside out i pray father that you'd be glorified and i pray that your son jesus would be lifted up right now in this special moment and i pray this in jesus name amen